and also there's pod fade where people just, you know, they started, haven't appreciated how much effort and time is involved, and then they just fade away without actually, you know, properly ending their podcast. You know, it's great after all these years of doing podcasts, and this is number 80, 80, uh, I'm finally now interviewing podcasters, right? So Deborah is giving us some really great tips and ideas how to get the best out of your podcasting. And she has a really valid point in saying that some people just fade away and they give up and they don't actually finish their podcast or say, right, this is the end of it or this is the end of a series, which was new to me as well in terms of how you do that. So fantastic story to to hear how Deborah got into podcasting and how she's helping other people doing podcasting. So you may never have thought of wanting to do podcasting and hopefully this will inspire you to get started because it is definitely a growing trend. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Deborah. How are you today? I am good, thank you, Michael. How are you? Oh, I'm brilliant. Thank you for asking and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really looking forward to having a chat with you because you're a fellow podcaster and it's it's great to learn and, and hear your story and journey or how you got into it into that because I know it's an interesting story. So thank you so much for coming. And um, I'm going to start with the same question I ask everybody. My audience are probably sick to death of this now, but <laughs> it, it's a good starter for 10. So would you like to tell us a little bit about your personal life? Where were you born? You can share a bit about your education. Um, where you now live, have you moved around, just so we get a sense of where it all started and we we get a real sense of where Deborah, you know, life started. So over to you, Deborah. So my life started back in Canada. Wow. So I am an original product of Canada. I was born in the gorgeous Vancouver, but I spent most of the childhood that I remember in a, a little town called Penticton, which is in the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia. So I was very lucky to grow up in a place that did and still does have gorgeous summers. There was a lake at either end of the town. Um, so there were beaches and orchards. And, and now there's a really big um, vineyard and um, you know, wine industry that's there. Whereas when I was growing up, it was more about the fruit. Mm. So grew up in a really lovely place and then moved back down to Vancouver. Right. And decided fairly randomly <laughs> that I would decide to uh, come to England and get to know my Nana because both my parents were British. Right discovered that as a result of my father being British, I was entitled to a British passport. Wow. I decided not to argue the fact that if it was only my mother that I wasn't entitled to that, I could only get a certificate of entitlement. But if it was, um, and I don't know if the rules have changed, but at that point, if it was your father or your grandfather, then you're basically a British citizen. Nice. Um, which is really very useful. Mm. So off I wandered. I literally came over here on a one way ticket. I can remember saying to a friend of mine as we were heading to the airport and she said, well, how long are you going to be gone for? And I said, I don't know. It could be a week, a month. It could even be five years. Oh. It's now 30 odd years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so it was a real just, um, you know, get on a plane, come over. I had some contacts in terms of um, where to stay initially. So I moved into a place with some Kiwis who were, you know, doing house shares, that sort of thing. Mm. And really just started doing temp work, doing some traveling. No no real idea of where I was going. And then I eventually evolved into doing project management. Right. And 
that is essentially where I sat for for probably a good 20 years in in big you know big blue chip corporates doing project management mainly in the IT sector and then a few years ago I decided that that I wanted to change mm-hmm. so I left the contract I was in and I decided that I would just essentially have a break, which was, you know, was fine. Mm-hmm. And I was doing a lot of experimenting and playing around with um, textile design, which I absolutely love doing. Right. I realized that this was a completely new and different area for me and a very crowded area as well. And that the reality was that, I wasn't going to make money at it in the near term, possibly never, right? but definitely not in the near term. So I thought, okay, so what are you going to do? Do you want to go back to another contract? And I thought, no, okay, let's start your own business. <laughs> Just like so- that. Just like that. It's, it's quite funny, actually. Well, I always think it's funny, whether other people do. In project management, I'm obviously very structured and very planned. Right. But when it comes to my personal things, it's much more, oh, you know, I'll just do this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See where it takes me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So so I did. And, and I kind of started off with a fairly vague idea of offering project management to smaller businesses that they would, you know, maybe benefit from the skills that I had. Right. Yeah. I think, though, that this is something that potentially, you know, other people go through as well, where they you know, you start off with this kind of just little idea, but you haven't formed it properly. Mm. And you haven't really worked through how you're going to offer it. You don't at this stage understand the realities of running your own business. Mm. Because, you know, if, if you're like me and you come from corporate, there are a whole bunch of things that are just dealt with for you. And while they might frustrate you, they're still being dealt with and you've got somebody to whinge about. But when it's you, you've suddenly got to figure out, well, who am I actually targeting? Who am I selling to? Who mm. It, you know, it is going to buy my services and how am I going to provide them and how much are they worth? And, you know, all of these different questions. And I think for me, it took me several, several two years. I, think, I can't remember the actual timeline now, um, but a couple of years, let's say, where I wasn't overly sure what I was offering. And I, and I, I could recognize that people, when they spoke to me, they couldn't figure out what box to put me in. And I've realized that it's really important for people to be able to put you in a box. Yes. Because if they can't, they don't understand what they what you do and they, they kind of forget about you because it's just too confusing and too much effort. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so I was having real trouble articulating what I was offering and um and and allowing them to put me in a box. Mm. So I I started to focus more on the overwhelm side and working with people who were at a stage where their business was essentially uh, taking up their headspace and they couldn't figure out their direction forward. So I was working with them to, in a very practical way, sit down, do some of that planning, answer the questions about, well, what do I work on first? Yeah. You know, the reality is you might have a list of 20 things that in your head you say you must do them all, mm. um, but the reality is you can't do them all there and then. So it's so really trying to support them in, in getting out of that overwhelm and finding ways to deal and to keep themselves moving forward doing some planning, potentially putting some processes in. Yeah, got it. And along there, I I think I went on to a a local radio station. And after that, by the way, if you can hear a dog barking, it's not (laughs) mine. (laughs) (laughs) It's next door's dog. It it is. It's just typical. (laughs) What do you sound asleep here? It just means we're live, doesn't it? That's right. <laughs> and dogs are part of life, and I I don't mind. It just happens, doesn't it? It's 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 real. 
Well, and I have to say that most people who work with me or know me, they know about Woody because one, I take him to as many places as I can with me. Um, and two, I talk about him all the time. <laughs> so he's very much part of my um, branding, I suppose. Well, if we're on the topic of Woody, what type of dog is Woody? <gasps> Woody is a Labradoodle. Oh! So gorgeous. <laughs> I, I call them a clown dog. <laughs> For me, they just like look like clowns. They're so happy and they're always like, you know, friendly. And yeah, they're great characters. Great they characters. are. And I just love, you know, when, when he sort of comes and you know, he just looks at you with these beautiful bright eyes and he always looks oh. like he's smiling. Well, except for when, of course, you, you know, you fed him and, and the food that you fed him isn't quite up to the standard <laughs> That, that he was aiming for. <laughs> then you get the, how can you do this to me? You're so horrible and cruel. <laughs> <laughs> or not enough of it. Yeah, not, not enough volume. <laughs> That's right. Or that crinkling noise was, was, I'm sure that was a treat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Uh, so, um, yeah, so sorry. No so, problem. So I could talk about Woody for ages. Um, but no, so, so I came out of that that radio show mm. and I've always had this little I suppose yearning to do something with my voice and and I've thought about voiceover work but never really pursued it right and I thought well I could start a podcast mm -hmm. so again another fairly random decision yes um so I thought, I'm gonna start a podcast and, and so I did. And essentially, I started it off. I did a lot of research. I, you know, I searched on the web. I learned what I needed to learn. I asked a few people if they'd like to be on it and then realized that when they said yes, that now I'd created this mountain of work for me to do because I had to, you know, schedule it. I had to get information from them. Yeah. Um, so, so I went through this this period where I was launching the podcast, I was learning all the way through. I was learning how to edit mm. the content as well. So really a completely different industry and a completely different skill set to, to what I already had. Yes. And, um, and, and through that, putting processes in place as well. So, so similar to yours, Michael, you know, my process is fairly automated in terms of, you know, somebody, once I've agreed that they're going to be a guest, they book their time, they get yes. sent emails automatically. Um, but, you know, that took a bit to, to work out. Yes, it does. It does. Absolutely. It is time consuming to get your head around it. And you have to keep going, don't you? Because otherwise you, you might give it up. <laughs> Well, exactly. And then they say that it's, um, I think it's seven episodes. If you don't get to the seventh episode, then the, the odds are you're, you're not going to continue. Right. Um, and also there's pod fade where people just, you know, they started, haven't appreciated how much effort and time is involved. And then they just fade away without actually, you know, properly ending their podcast. Right. So because it is time consuming and there's so much out there that says, oh, anybody can do it. It's really easy. And it's, yeah, recording it is pretty easy. Yeah. Everything else around it that adds the time in, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And and it's really interesting. You said, what, what did you call it? Pod fade? Pod fade, yes. Yeah. So th I've never heard of that. But I've recognized it in myself in terms of not like in the beginning, there were lots of people I knew who were prepared to come on the podcast um, because I do actually enjoy the interview thing better than anything else. Well, there is one other podcast that I do, which I'll, I can share about, but that, it's not about me. It's about you. But what I found is that it, it has slowed down at times for me. So 2019 has been a drier if i compare in 2018 i did i did nearly 30 well 2017 i did 31 interviews um 2018 i did 29 so more or less the same but this year and we're nearly at the end of it i've only done like 22 or so and so i'm definitely down on the previous year and so that is a tiny bit of pod fade where I haven't kept the momentum going. So that's really interesting you say that. 
Yeah, and and I think it is really, you know, it's hard to to keep the momentum going. And when you're doing interviews, again, in theory, that's easier because you're speaking to somebody, you can bounce back and forth off of each other. But there's all that, again, that time before and that time after where you've got to find that contact, you've got Mm. to try and not just be having the same conversation over and over again. Mm. Um, you know, just a different voice on the end of the line. Yes. So it, it's, it is difficult. And I know I made a very conscious decision at the beginning to split into seasons right. so that I didn't feel that there was a need to, to run this, you know, every week nonstop. Right. But I'm also conscious that at this point, um, you know, there's been a lot happening for me since September. Mm-hmm. And I actually haven't put out a podcast um, episode since September. Right. And this is the first time for me that it wasn't a planned season break right right Um, and it was just that too much going on I've got some interviews that need editing ready to go but between other clients and other things that are happening um and, and I'm very aware of it so every week I'm thinking okay you need to put this back into action yes because I do enjoy doing it yeah but it, it's again, it's it's that time, it's that energy, and and knowing, I guess, where you're going with it and why you're doing it. I I I never considered the seasons, and it's so interesting that you should bring that up. And was that a conscious decision right at the beginning to do it in seasons? Yeah, it, it was something I yes, I, I made a very definitive. This is going to be seasonal I'm going to not seasonal but into seasons Mm. um I didn't decide how many episodes there were going to be right and and each of my seasons has been different so I think the first one was 18 right um I think the second one so I started in I've just been going for just over a year now Mm. um And I started, I think the second one was 16, but then the third one started off in a somewhat mad and frenetic way where I basically, the beginning of January this year, I did a daily podcast for a week. Right. And hindsight, (laughs) (laughs) you don't decide on the 2nd of January that you're going to interview two people every day. No. Um, and put that podcast out daily for that week when the, the first recording is going to be on the third. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, but none that, so it was for Microbiz Matters Day with um, with, with uh, uh, Tony Robinson and Tina, uh, Tina Bowden, who are both brilliant characters. And I really believe in the Microbiz Matters Day, um, you know, what they're trying to do with that and increasing awareness of microbiz. Yes. And, and all of that. Um, so, so I was really glad that I did it, but it took a lot out of me. Yes. And I'm talking to them about what we might do this year. And I know that it's not a decision being made on 2nd of January. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but that resulted in, again, a slightly shorter season in terms of time. Mm. Because I had done so much and then was trying to catch up. And so so each of mine has been different. And they've also evolved in the type of interviews. Yes. Season one was completely interviews. So I only interviewed people and, um, you know, a range of different business types and different individuals. Mm. Season two, I started to mix it up a bit more. So I, I did some episodes that were just me talking about something Mm. did some that were interviews with again you know entrepreneurs business owners and some that were a mixture of smaller interviews that I tied together to to tell a bit of a story or to give some different experiences so really starting to experiment a bit more with with my voice and what I wanted to say as well right what people were you know hearing from my guests and I think that's kind of the nice thing about it is it gives you that one, it gives you a break yeah. and two, it gives you that time to, to consider what you want to do with the podcast. Cause it doesn't have to stay static, you know, just because you made a decision on day one, it doesn't mm. have to stay in that mold forevermore. That's really interesting. Yeah. That's very interesting because, um, So in my case, I've decided to stick with the same format 
and started another podcast with somebody else that where we both are speaking to the to 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 the uh, microphone about certain topics it's to do with public speaking and, and storytelling in fact right. so that's where i'm able to give my voice a bigger emphasis rather than my guest's voice if you know what i mean i do so i've taken it out of my own podcast and started another one which is called the story of a speech and because it's got speech in it and story in it. And um, so it's really interesting. You said, set, I like what you've said about doing it in seasons because then you're able to decide um, what you will, what you can do. And I've noticed the season thing because there's one podcast I listen to that comes and goes in seasons, which is called The Digital Human, uh, which I really like. And and I'd, I'd never until you've said it, I've never really considered it. So that's that's really great advice for anybody listening who's starting because it takes the pressure off a little bit, doesn't it? As well, it, it does absolutely because you know as as we've said, it is time consuming, and to know that you know you can create whatever number you decide. So if you want to do you know twelve or, or whatever it is mm. that you can work on those you can get them out and then you can say okay now i'm going to have a break and that break can be as long as you want it to be yeah and, and you know and yes there there are especially when you're starting there's the impact that if you've got into somebody's life you're part of their routine and you suddenly stop that they may or may not pick you back up again right but equally if they really enjoyed you and you're communicating with them and you're letting them know when you're going to be back the odds are that they're going to pick you back up again. And for those that you don't pick up, then you'll pick up other people instead. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. So what's the, um, so that's the, the, so because you've had um, a bit of a pause on the season since September, and I have looked at your list of, of episodes, by the way, and there's a very dear friend who I haven't seen for years, Mindy Gibbons Klein. Yes. Uh, we used to be buddies. We were a buddy at a an event, a Tony Robbins event, uh, many years ago. <laughs> so it's really nice to see her listed on your, your interviews. I will definitely listen to that one. Um, but because you've had a hiatus since September and are starting to think about what to do next and where to go with it, what have you been doing in the meantime, then, that's taken up all your time? It's a mixture of things. So, so there's some personal things where I seem to be spending a lot of time at physio and various things around uh, just uh, my body. Right. Okay. Which I won't Understood. Bore you with. <laughs> Understood. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's all going in the right direction. But oh, that's it's good. It takes when you're when you're trying to to get it going in the right direction. It takes up both physical and mental space. Of course. Um, so so that's part of what's been driving. And then I've been pushing forward. I do some work for a range of clients and trying to help them to push things forward and to develop. And and also as part of it, I put together a five day podcast challenge to to try and. Um, one, you know, help people to get started on their podcast, but also to, you know, make it clear about the services that I offer as well. Mm -hmm. So I've been spending time starting to push that out and put that together. And, um, you know, I got it out there fairly quickly, but now trying to just work on refining it a bit. Mm. So, so that's taken. So I guess the actual business side has taken up my time as opposed to the podcast itself. Right. And and, um, you know, looking at clients who are, you know, so I've got one client who is finding it difficult at the moment to to keep the podcast moving forward right. and trying to work with her to find ways to to help her to, to get into the swing of it again to, you know, she's had a number of challenges that, that have impacted her. Yeah. And, and so those sorts of things with, with different clients and things, just working to to support them, and and just found that 
I want in my podcast in the next season, I want it to have interviews still because I really enjoy talking to people and I've spoken to, uh, you know, still got a couple backed up and one is to, you know, this fantastic entrepreneur from Australia um, and another is from, you know, a an, an fairly new entrepreneur here in the UK who works with businesses um, about inclusiveness. Um, so she's, uh, I can never remember her business name. Her podcast is part of me. And, but it's about working with businesses about how to include people with disabilities in either as customers or as um, as employees as well and to make that environment work and and be effective for everybody. Mm, great. So, so it's got, you know, people lined up for it. But I also want to start telling a bit more of my business story and to start sharing some of the ups and downs of, of what I'm going through. So in yeah. the same way that I'm asking my guests to do it, to start being a little bit more open about, you know, my journey as well. And to hope that, you know, what I'm saying again will resonate with people and the learnings that I take from the different guests, the, you know, the things that they speak about that really resonate with me or the things that, you know, I've heard them go through and can recognize that I'm going through that. So, I'm just trying to change it a bit. And I found it quite difficult to start recording that first one that I want to put out there. Right. Got it. Got it. So, Because I don't know about you, but I find it much more difficult. To, if I'm doing a quick five minute one, it's no problems whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But if I'm talking a little bit longer, that requires a bit more thought and preparation. Yeah, I, I think... Preparation is obviously key. I totally agree with you. And sometimes not being prepared is also quite authentic as well. <laughs> um, so it has it has different different benefits. So in so in listening to you, um, other than running your own business podcast. You also then work with other people to launch to launch and manage their podcast. Is that correct? Yes. So I have a range of. So basically, I'm the podcast launcher and podcast concierge. Right. So explain that. Explain that, please. So the podcast launcher is all about people starting their own podcast. And I run a number, I either do it one to one. So I have a, a podcast launcher product, which is working with people one to one to go through everything that they need to actually, you know, take their podcast from that initial, just sort of little kernel of an idea, building it out, finding out who you're talking to, what you're doing the podcast for, all the way up to having your artwork, your title, having recorded the first two episodes and have it out there on, you know, Apple and Spotify and Google um, and you know so, so you've launched your podcast and that is something that well I really enjoy I like talking to people about their story and helping them to see where they might go with it rather than you know so a lot of people come into it thinking I'm a marketer so I want to tell people about marketing and of course if all you're doing is selling mm. It, you know, nobody's going to listen. So helping them to find the story in it, helping them to find the reason that their podcast is going out and the reason why people are going to listen, I, I really enjoy. So the podcast launcher is, um, well, there's the one-to-one, -one, but then I also do some one-day training, which right. is in a group. And it doesn't go, it doesn't take you all the way to the end, but it's working through what it is your podcast is going to be about and also teaching people about you know the different pieces that you need as you'll know michael the you know the fact that you need a podcast host you need to you know submit it through to apple and all the rest and just helping them to understand the pieces of the puzzle that allows the recording to actually get out there for people to listen to it yeah, yeah. Um, and i'm also looking at doing a um, an online version of that which will not It'll be led by me still, so it'll still be interactive. It'll just be that you don't have to go somewhere. So we'll use Zoom or Zoom Rooms, something like that for it. Mm, that sounds amazing. And it's and how long have you been doing that work, the podcast launcher? So the podcast launcher 
I would say I really started that properly in January of this year. Right. So essentially the summer before last, somebody said to me, have you thought about, you know, teaching other people? And I hadn't. Mm. Um, and I went through a period of probably that September to December last year of, of putting a course together of, of kind of, you know, telling people I was doing it, but not really having the belief in myself that I knew enough to be able to do that. Mm. Um, and then I, I sat on this, um, it was a workshop. It was being run by somebody who, who's got, you know, very successful podcaster, a very successful entrepreneur generally. And, and he ran, I think it was three sessions over three evenings about podcasting. And so I, I went to that. It was all online as well. And I realized that everything he said, I knew. Right. And there was one thing he said that I knew categorically was incorrect. Wow. That I had no doubt, you know, so there was no question in my mind that it was wrong. Mm. And that just gave me this huge boost because I thought, you know, that there were nuances and things that I learned from it and, and, you know, some different ways of thinking about things. But the actual, the actual base knowledge about podcasting, it just gave me that real confidence of, yeah, I do know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, and I, and I do have the right to offer that to people and that they, they can put their trust in me because I do know what I'm talking about. Mm. So really, it was January that I then started actually putting the, the the full offer together and making it available to people and and speaking about it a lot more openly and and more confidently as well. Yeah. Oh, that sounds amazing. And you know, the thing is, people. Um, I mean, it really sounds interesting how you had to prove to yourself that you were knowledgeable enough to teach this stuff. Um, because you're obviously believing, oh, maybe I'm a fraud. You know, people people are going to find out that I don't know quite enough yet, uh, and all of these doubts that creep into our head. Whereas actually, sometimes the best way to learn more is to get started. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. And it sounds amazing that you're doing this, and. Um, okay, so that's the podcast launcher. And then what's the concierge, podcast concierge about? So the concierge bit is is for people who have their podcast up and running. They may or may not have launched it through me, mm -hmm. but they want to, to relieve some of the um, the burden that they're under to keep it going. Right. So, so what they can do is they can essentially outsource to me various levels of, of concierge service to, um, you know, it can be as simple as I'm actually just providing you with the podcast host and I'm doing some very basic editing of topping and tailing it with your intro and outro. And I'm the one that's actually submitting it and releasing it all the way through to, you know, fully editing it um, to arranging guests if that's what you want i also again depending on the client i've got you know one client who i interview on a regular basis so for for her podcast she finds it useful to sometimes be at the end of the questions so so that's part of the service that i provide to her as well Great. so it's really anything that is there to to help you to keep your podcast going yeah. without you having to do all of the work yourself, whether that's, you know, developing your strategy for the next few months, um, as well as taking on some of the practical work or whatever combination. Got you. Okay. Sounds, sounds incredible. What a fabulous idea. I mean, I do sometimes get emails from people saying, uh, I have a guest for your podcast. This is their details and giving their background, their story, and this is why they're going to be good for your podcast. So is that the kind of thing you do as well, getting people onto podcasts? I would... I, I don't tend to work from the outside of the guest. Right. Okay. So, so, so if you said to me, Deborah, um, I really, you know, I want some more guests on. I'm looking for these type of people. Mm -hmm. Then I, 
would be able to take that on and to look for them for you. Or if you said, you know, here's a list of the five people I really want to get on my show. Right. Can you liaise with them to, to try and get them on, to find the dates, to, to do all of that sort okay. of thing. So, so I'm less likely to do it from a guest perspective. Not to get people onto podcasts. Yeah. yeah. Because, okay. Because I think for me that that's the, it's a different job. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. So here's, here's, I don't know if you've tried this at all. Oh, well, let me ask the question first of all. Do you think for small businesses like us and others <laughs> um, that it's a good idea, even if you are a podcaster, to get yourself onto other podcasts? Yes. And why do you think it's a good idea? Because you are then what I call cross pollinating. Right. You are, you know, so, so from your perspective, Michael, having me on as a guest means that I'm going to tell people, you know, that I'm on your podcast. Mm -hmm. So you're getting heard by people who may or may not have heard of you before. Yeah. I am um, hopefully you're going to promote that I'm on your show. Yeah. So I will get heard by people again who may or may not have heard of me previously. And you know, that may or may not lead anywhere, but you're now increasing your awareness, you're increasing your authority, your visibility, and, and giving more people that opportunity to decide whether they like you and whether they want to listen to your podcast, or if you don't have a podcast, if they want to, to look you up, because, you know, your business sounds like something they might be interested in. Got you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I agree with you 100%. And I've not taken enough positive action in that direction. So the other day, and I'll just share that with you and other listeners, is one of the strategies I adopted, and it's very early days because I only started it literally last week. Um, I reached out to other podcasters uh, on LinkedIn. So I did a search for them on LinkedIn by looking for the term podcast host and invited to connect with them and asked them whether they'd be willing to be a guest on mine and whether they'd be interested in having me as a guest on theirs. So it's, it's like, you know, doing a an exchange effectively to say, really about me getting heard more on other podcasts. There was a there was one guest I interviewed who wasn't a podcaster. He had a product to sell. And when I researched him, researched him, every other post on Twitter was a link to a podcast. He had done in a month, he'd done something like 30 interviews in a month. Wow. Um, and he said, just doing that has took his business to a different level. And he got a lot more exposure that he would never have been able. All the Facebook adverts, Twitter adverts, Google adverts would never have gotten him to the place where he was by just going on lots of podcasts. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is because, you know, to the people that are listening to, to your podcast or to my podcast, they've made the decision that they they like us so they trust us they feel mm. that they know us they like us they like you know they may or may not like all of our guests but in general they like us yeah so as soon as you invite somebody on it's it's like inviting you know you know your friend and a new friend over to your house for dinner there's an immediate trust there, an immediate, well, hang on a second, you know, Michael's talking to this person, so I'm going to give them a chance and I'm going to, you know, listen to them because mm. Michael has given them essentially his stamp of approval. Yes. And that is, is huge. That's a brilliant point. I love that point. That's really, really important. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so w what happened with the whole textiles thing then? Is that not happening anymore? I still play around with that. So I still love um, doing so. So basically I, I do what what I think of as digital fingerprint, finger painting. Right. Um, so I create things 
initially on my iPad, which is why I thought of it as finger painting Mm -hmm. and create patterns and designs. And it took me a little while to decide what they were because I, I was looking at them and thinking, well, they're not, they're not artwork. You know, some of them you might put on your wall, but most of them weren't. And it was then that I realized that they were, they were, textiles that they would be brilliant actually on almost anything on you know cushions or mugs or anything like that so I have some that are still up there and available on things like Redbubble and um, you know some sites which provide print-on-demand services right but and I and I still create more But I haven't. I'm hoping at some point that I'll be able to actually focus more time on it and to have it essentially sitting there as a nice little side hustle that may or may not make any money, but satisfies my desire to share them and to enjoy what I'm doing and to have them going out to people, I guess. Um, So, you know, I've had very positive feedback on the designs that I've done when I've shown them to other people. And, you know, obviously everybody's got slightly different tastes, but, Mm. you know, so they all like different things. Um, So so I'd like to see it come back into my life in a bigger way at some point in time. But right now it's definitely, uh, okay, I've got a bit of time. I'm going to play around with my Photoshop skills or creating patterns from something I've drawn. Oh, wow. Enjoy. Really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it sounds like you're very creative, um, both in the kind of podcasting side, in the textile side. So creativity is definitely, you know, very much part of what you're about. Um, so well done for, you know, making sure that they, you know, play an important part in your life in terms of the whole creativity thing. I, I I think we don't give ourselves enough credit of how creative we can actually be at times. <laughs> so well done. <laughs> Sounds amazing. And, Thank you. And what's next for podcasting? Well, let, let me ask two questions. What's next for podcasting for you? And then where do you think podcasting is going to be going? in the UK or globally, what's your view on it? So next for podcasting for me is is really around just, again, slightly evolving my podcast so that there's more of me in it as well as the interviews with other people because I still really enjoy those conversations. And, again, just getting that next season going and – Um, keeping it moving and evolving. In terms of podcasting generally, I think it is still a hugely exciting place to be. Mm. It's it's still just growing so rapidly. It's kind of weird in some ways because it's been around for a good, you know, 15, 16 years, Mm. but it's only in the past couple of years that it's taken off in the way that, you know, pretty much everybody has now heard of a podcast, whether they've listened to one or quite understand what it is, maybe not, Mm. but they've heard of it. Whereas a couple of years ago, they wouldn't have. And there's a lot of work and things that are happening in the industry to standardize things like reporting on downloads. So, you know, Apple has typically been the one that, you know, it's the Apple charts, it's Apple who have the main stats and you can't necessarily get information across all of the different platforms. And and even if you use some of the tools that are out there to, to try and um, bring those together, Mm. you may not get an accurate accurate view. And I know that there are conversations happening to try and make it um, more standardized, to make it easier for people to get the real information around their podcast. Yes. There's so much um, things, so many things happening as well. And I'm I'm a bit more hesitant about whether I feel positive about these or not, but more things like, you know, the BBC commissioning podcasts. I think Spotify is now looking at commissioning their own podcasts. And it's good in some, so this is my view, obviously Mm. good in some ways in terms of visibility, but The negative side, from my perspective, is that if it goes too far, Mm. 
it could shut the door on the people who just want to start their own podcast. Right. And I think that would be a real shame. I think that the fact that this is such a wide open platform and that anybody can start their podcast is actually really powerful. Mm. And and if we were to lose that by it being shut down to, you know, well, hang on a second, I'm not going to listen to your podcast because you're no longer on Spotify. They only put on, you know, ones that they have um, created or approved. Mm. Um, then suddenly you're losing an audience because of a decision um, that, you know, that, that company has made. And I'm not saying that Spotify is doing that. That is just to be clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, BBC already do that. BBC Sound does not have every podcast on it. It has mm. BBC podcasts and certain ones that they've, um, you know, decided to put on for, for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so those elements worry me a little bit, and and not just from my personal perspective, but I think just, you know, it's that groundswell of of energy that the that anybody can do it, that they bring to it, that make it change and grow, and and if it suddenly becomes really kind of regulated and um and controlled by just a few big organizations, yes. I think it would, um, I don't know, it might be for the better. I might just be, you know, but it, it worries me. <laughs> well, it's like anything where, you know, unfortunately, because we live in a capitalist society where the money flows, the people go. And, and if people are making a lot of money out of advertising on podcasts, then that's where, you know, people that are perhaps not advertising or haven't got the volume of listeners, you're going to be at the bottom of the pile. It's as simple as that because people want the revenue growth. They want the revenue income stream. Um, so which is, which is another whole question, which is what is your um, – Last question, I promise. What's your view in terms of having advertising on your podcast? And when when do you think it's appropriate to have it? I think it is completely up to you. So I my initial decision on my podcast was that I wouldn't monetize it, that it wasn't about um it wasn't about making money. It was about increasing my visibility. It was, you know, all of those things that I've mentioned, you know, no light trust, all of that. Yes. However, one of the things that I am looking at doing in the new year is having some sponsorship. Right. Um, but being quite careful about how I do that in terms of wanting the sponsors to be um, people who are bringing value to the listeners as well. So, so for me, it's very much about I want to, you know, and I'll see how this goes. We'll, we'll see if it works or not. But I want to make sure that I am still giving a good listening experience and that the listening experience isn't being taken over by a sponsor or by advertising. Right. Got you. Yeah. And, and I think that's a decision that every podcaster has to make for themselves, that if they want to put advertising in, and they've got the number of downloads to to you know justify it from the bigger advertising options to to accept that they might lose some listeners over that yes that some listeners might go they might gain others though Mm -hmm. You know, you never know. And, and also, if the financial side is working, then those, you know, th those listeners probably don't worry, uh, don't matter as much, which sounds harsh. But, um, but, but it's, you may also not have that control over exactly what's being advertised. Sure. So I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Personally, I would not want something that is just full of ads. I know I've, I've spoken to, you know, various people who even when listening to podcasts, if the person who is, um, is hosting the podcast is forever telling them to go to their website, you know, so they're continually promoting their own product mm. that they actually get tired of that. Right. Yeah. So, 
So I think my, my personal recommendation is to make sure that your podcast is delivering value to your listeners. Yeah. And that if you're advertising or monetizing it in some way, that the amount of advertising or sponsorship is not substantially detracting from the value that you're giving. Mm. Well said. Yeah, I like that. I, I'll just briefly mention... Uh, this may be of interest to you and the listeners. There is an amazing podcast, I don't know if you've heard it, by an organization called Bellingcat. Um, and they've just released their first season of podcasts. It's about six episodes where they are actually telling the story of their investigative journalism into the downing of flight MH, I think it's 17, the Malaysian flight uh, over the Ukraine that was shot down and all of their research. They're, they're an amazing organization. They, they've researched and uncovered many di different things. It's a tiny little bit scary <laughs> in terms of some of the detail that they describe in the podcast. I will just say that as a bit of a kind of health warning in terms of if you can listen to that stuff. But the way that they actually uh, look at getting money for it is they do a their own little advert. The producer does a their own little advert for people to contribute on Patreon. Um, yes. Which I think is a really not I've, – I've heard the minimalists do this as well, where it's not advertising organizations, but they're saying, look, if you enjoy this podcast, you can donate to me, and that means I will continue – what I'm doing and we'll make and we'll give you some bonus content as a result as well. Uh, and that's quite a neat way of doing it, I think. It, it is. It's a really, um, well, as you say, a really neat way of doing it. And what you can do with Patreon is you can set it up so, you know, you can say, okay, well, if you give me, you know, five pounds, then you get, I don't know, a, a sticker that you can put onto your car and say, hey, I listen to Deborah. <laughs> Um, or you know, if you give me 50, you get a t-shirt and, you know, if you give me a hundred, then actually maybe you come and record something with me. So, so you can have different layers of, mm. of reward, which also can then help to increase that person's engagement and buy-in to your podcast because they're, they're feeling more part of it. And um, as well as, as you've said, that you can also grant them access to, you know, specific bits of content that mm. isn't widely available. Yeah. So it's a really good way if you're, if you're looking at wanting to, essentially it's, um, you know, it's having patrons. So if we think back to, I'm going to say olden times, you know, <laughs> when painters and things like that, they would have a patron who would, you know, pay them to be there and to paint for them and to support them and mentor them while they're getting on with their art. Um, and that's what these people are doing is they're saying, yeah, actually, I really like what you're doing. I really want to support you and I want you to keep doing your podcast. So, so I'm going to give you some money, Great. which is fantastic. Great. Deborah, thank you so much for your wisdom and, and sharing those tips and ideas. Very, very useful. Where can people find you? Where can they find the podcast, uh, your website, and, and any other social media you'd like them to, to connect with you? So they can find so the five day challenge is at podcastconcierge.com forward slash five as in the number, not the word, hyphen day, hyphen podcast, hyphen challenge. And that is a free challenge. If you sign up, it basically gives you five days of, um, of activities to, to launch your podcast. You can get more information about me and the podcast services generally at bridgeroadconsultants.com. Okay. And what else do we have? We have, um, and, you, and you can find my podcast on there as well. Or if you search on anything for Bridging Gaps, the business podcast, I'll come up or search for Deborah Levitt and my podcast typically comes up as well. And yeah, social media Instagram, Bridge Road Consultants, Facebook, Bridge Road Consultants, Twitter, Bridge Road Cons. What have I forgotten? LinkedIn. 
LinkedIn, look for Deborah Levitt. You'll find Bridge Road Consultants, but I'm more likely to post things under Deborah Levitt. And your designs, would you like them to look at your oh, designs? Oh, my designs. Oh, where's the best place to look at that? So best place for that would be Red Bubble. Mm-hmm. And to look for it, so redbubble.com. And then I think it's forward slash Deb L, D-E-B-E-L designs. Hang on, let me actually just double check that no so problem. that I can confirm, convince my mouth to type things in. You know how it is that when your computer has been sitting there, it decides it's actually just going to doze. <laughs> yes. Wake up. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry if you can hear it tapping. That's okay. We know this is live. It is (laughs) it is Debel Designs. Yes, and and you can actually go to red um redbubble dot designs dot com and that will take you to Redbubble as well. Okay, fabulous. So say that again, redbubble dot. Debel, D-E-B-E-L, designs. Okay. Dot com. Brilliant. So people can check out your handiwork as well. They can. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I'd, I'd love to keep in touch with you and, and compare notes on podcasts at any time. So feel free to to just pick up the phone and we can have a chat about anything at all. Um, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and, and sharing your story. And fingers crossed we might meet in person some stage in the future as well. Um, and thank you so much, Deborah. And bye for now. Bye, Michael. And thank you very much. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 